give a girl some privacy. I'm just kidding. Welcome to my bathroom makeover. My bathroom is seriously confused as to which era or style it belongs to. The quarry tile flooring is reminiscent of a commercial kitchen. Granite countertops once cried luxury, but the builder grade nickel hardware is telling a different story. And nothing screams 80s bathroom like a glass block shower. So this is a very easy, pretty affordable, render-friendly thing to do to spruce up your casework, and that is swapping out your hardware. Most hardware comes in a standard size. Before you order hardware, you want to measure the existing hole. If the pre-existing holes will work with new hardware, then you can easily purchase new hardware and swap it out super fast and nice, and it'll put your own touch on the space. Okay, so I'm showing you my tricks here because I need you to see what's happening. There is a sink and a mirror and a window above and none of them are on the same center line. So I think what I'm gonna do is just shift the mirror on the wall so it is centered above the sink. I can't move the sink, nor can I move the window. So this is the one area where I can take some control. All right, so I'm a renter. I do not own this property. However, I'm not gonna be so naive as to market this tutorial as renter friendly because it's more of like renter ambitious. Renter that's very bold and testing the boundaries. What I'm about to do is not something that you should just do without the permission of your landlord or your property manager. However, I have lived here for several years now and I kind of get how things are going. I have this mirror and it is kind of like a dark brown wood gray. It's not in great shape. So I'm going to give this a little like spiffy sand, give it a nice coat of paint. I don't think he's going to notice when I move out that this mirror is now black instead of a dark wood gray. It doesn't even match what's in the bathroom right now. So as long as it looks good and I don't like break it and make it look totally horrible, I don't think he's going to notice. So I took the mirror off. You can see the screw has just been painted over with drippy, drippy paint. What a bad job, guys. Whoever you are that painted this between the tent. Not cool. Anyway, I thought they might have hung the mirror not centered because they're trying to hit a stud, but as you can see, the stud's over here. I don't know what they were doing. Not measuring, that's what. So the mirror has been painted and it's outside. I'm waiting for it to dry. And in the meantime, I'm going to get started on the next really exciting part of my bathroom makeover. And that is a backsplash. I have these hexagonal gold peel and stick tiles. They are made of metal and they have adhesive backing. Now, this is very important. Remember when I said that this isn't a rental friendly makeover? It's more of like a renter that's bold and willing to test that boundary. And that applies with these. So I see these advertisements a lot as a total rental friendly product and that is just not the case. Peel and stick tile it's meant to be a permanent method of adhesion. It's appealing <laughs> to people to purchase because you don't need to grout your wall. You can just peel it and stick it to the wall. However this isn't like removable wallpaper. The analogy I would use is compare a vinyl cling you put on your car window to a bumper sticker. Yes the bumper sticker will come off but it'll probably take the paint off too and that definitely applies with this. It'll be pretty tough to get off and it may probably will take the paint with it. So understand if you're a renter and you want to use peel and stick tile, this isn't going to be like a magic woo it's done. Leave a couple of days before you move out to take it off and then repaint your wall because it's going to peel the paint out with it. That's just simply how the product is. Not a temporary product, it's a permanent product. But that doesn't mean you can't use it in your rental unit. Chances we're willing to take for our own personal enjoyment, am I right? With this hexagonal tile, I guess I'll link it below. You buy it by the linear foot, 12 inches square, but there is one of these four inch panels which has a flat edge. I would highly recommend mocking it up. You could just get these tiles and kind of lay it out and see what it's gonna look like. I used Illustrator before I bought these tiles actually, and because I was able to mock it up digitally, I know that I'm gonna start my tile in the center of the room. Think about how the final pattern is going to look before you just attack the wall. I'm all for attacking the wall, but with a little bit of planning. Speaking of planning and attacking the wall, another very important part of any sort of product you buy and want to install. Read the instructions and the specifications. The instructions will tell you exactly how you need to install these so that you 
can claim the manufacturer warranty. If you veer off the instructions, you will get a warranty. Now, maybe you don't want the warranty, like myself. I don't really care about this warranty because I'm a renter, this is temporary. I don't want it to stick too good to the wall. The instructions on mine, they actually wanted me to like prime it right before I stuck it, but it's already a painted wall and I don't need it to stick like super good. I just need it to stick good enough. So I'm just gonna start without like repainting the wall because I'm also anticipating painting the wall when I move out. I was able to get about two rows of the peel and stick tile on the wall. The peel and stick part is super easy. You just take the backing off and press it against the wall. It's adhering very well. It's also pretty easy to line these pieces up. What is challenging though, creating the straight cut on the edges so that you can fit them in the weird spots on the wall. I've marked with blue tape the amount of length I'm going to keep. Now first, I'm gonna take off these individual three tiles. To do that, I just take an X-Acto knife. Be very careful when you're doing this. Open apart the tile, poke through, so I know where on the back the tile is. So now I can just score through the adhesive here, the diagonals. Make sure your finger is not behind the plucky when you do this. And there we go, we've taken off three of these tiles. Now I am going to have to cut these two in half. Remove my tape and then align this so that it goes corner to corner. And then I will take a utility knife and just score so I know where the half is. It's gonna make it easier to break off. Now I'm gonna flip it over and do the same thing. So I wanna cut all the way through the adhesive. This is the tricky part, very important. Safety goggles. Always wear appropriate PPE whenever you're working with any power tool. So I have right here a Dremel tool with just like the metal cutty bit. I'm going to start at a pretty low speed and just kind of go along the score line. Be very careful with your fingers. I'm going to be holding right here because these are individual tiles, so I don't want it to fly away. Okay, you can see I have thoroughly cut through that guy. All right, now these edges are gonna be pretty sharp, so I'm gonna sand them down. But first, I'm gonna check my fit. You can see that it's not quite lining up here and here. So what I'm gonna do is file down that edge over there. Okay, so now the fitting is a lot better. Yeah, I finished with this wall. I am intentionally not going to fill this space right here because the mirror hangs over it. Remember when I said that you wanted to start in the middle and work outward? Well, on the sides, I'm actually going to start on the edge because what I care about is this line. install a new cover plate, I am going to go and seal all of my seams with a clear caulk. Only cut a little tiny bit off of the nozzle because you can always cut a bigger hole, but you can't uncut your existing hole. Now that I've finished installing this new hexagonal backsplash tile, rather than sticking on the old ugly cover plate, I actually went to the store and bought a new cover plate, which I spray painted gold. Cover plates are very inexpensive. This was only 79 cents. I actually ended up having to grind down the side of this cover plate because the new tile added thickness to the wall. And so the plate was protruding too much to fit over it. But now that I ground it down like an eighth of an inch, it fits and it should be pretty nice and snug. So 
this is my handy hair tool organizer. I got it from PBT several years back and I even put my name on it because hey, I like my name. Anyway, the reason it's sitting over here on the side of the counter opposite of my receptacle is because this cord is so thick. I originally had it on the other side of the counter, but the cord itself being all bunched up was taking up like four or five inches of space. I didn't have anywhere to hide it. So I moved it over here so I could stretch the cord out and keep it against the wall. I had originally used like little tacks to keep it up against the wall, but since I have the new tile there, I don't want this cord to intrude on that and make it look messy. So I purchased a cord organizer kit from the Home Depot. Uh, you can get these in a number of sizes. I bought this in white and I spray painted it gold because I wanted to blend in nicely with the tile. So hopefully this works. Welcome to my bathroom floor, where I will be spending the majority of the day today because it is tiling day. Yes, you heard that right. I am a renter. This is my rented bathroom in my apartment, and I'm going to be covering up the tile, which is not typically something a renter should do. I've said this before, but I wouldn't describe this as renter friendly, more like renter ambitious, knows they're gonna have a lot to clean up before they move out. So before you attempt anything of the sort, make sure you read your lease agreement, get a feel for your landlord, and make sure that you feel comfortable doing this because it might not work in your situation. So I said tiling. What I'm doing is tiling over the existing tile. I'm not going to be demoing. Instead, I'll be installing a product called Vinyl Composite Tile, also known as VCT, or Resilient Flooring. It looks like this. So I'm actually pretty familiar with this product. It's something that professionally I specify for use in commercial break rooms rooms, locker rooms. It's a durable product. What is like very beneficial about it is it's individual tiles. So if one of them gets kind of scuffed up or broken, you can take out the one tile and replace it without having to replace the entire floor. So it's really great for commercial use. There's this company called Floor Pops. They make VCT, vinyl composite tile, and it's peel and stick. I think the cute name Floor Pops has people thinking like, oh, it's a fun sticker I can put on my bathroom floor. Not the case read the product specifications and the installation manual, peel and stick refers to how it is applied to the floor. Rather than using a separate adhesive, you just peel off the backing and the adhesive is already on the product. The subfloor for this product, typically, like if you own your own home, you would install this over a plywood subfloor, not over existing tile. That is not the appropriate way to do it. However, I'm a renter. I can't demo this tile, so I'm going to install it with existing quarry tile as my subfloor. That is not recommended by the manufacturer and I don't think that they will back your warranty for that. So if you own your own home, consider demoing your existing floor, especially if it's just linoleum. Rip that out. So how does vinyl tile perform in a bathroom? One thing you need to consider with any type of flooring is water. In commercial use, I would not specify VCT for a restroom just because commercial restrooms receive very vigorous wash down. However, your household bathroom doesn't get as wet as you think it might. Unless you've got a plumbing issue, your bathroom floor doesn't really receive that much water. So VCT should hold up pretty fine in your own personal bathroom. So the particular floor tile I got is by a brand called, I think you say Achim? 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 I don't know. It's spelled A-C-H-I-M. And they have several designs. I like this one, which is like a diamond pattern. I mocked it up several times. I had a couple that I had narrowed it down to. And one of the things I needed to consider was you don't have a visible route line. So I wanted it to be something that I like the continued pattern of. Step number one, preparing the floor. Normal typical subfloor for this product would be something like plywood. Normally existing tile is not an appropriate subfloor because there's grout lines. You have a lot of elevation change with existing tiles. So that's going to affect how well the tile adheres to the subfloor. To prepare my tile floor, I am going to be cleaning the absolute stink out of it with a product called trisodium phosphate. Pretty inexpensive. You can pick it up from your local hardware store. Just mix it according to the 
pack it. Open the windows, wear gloves. The reason we're cleaning the floor so vigorously is because it doesn't matter how well you clean your floor on a regular basis. The bathroom receives residue from like hairspray, you know, all sorts of products, and it's just not gonna be that clean. So we wanna hit it really well with the TSP so that the adhesive sticks well to the floor. It sticks good, good enough, not too good. All right, I'm about to put on my grubbiest clothes and get elbow deep in some water. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell from the camera, but my bathroom floor is sparkling. I think it's the cleanest it's ever been. Now that my subfloor, the existing quarry tile, is prepared, it's time to start the tiling process. Before I embarked on this ambitious renter project, I called a friend and a mentor to me, Jim, who has a lot of experience not only as an architect, but also in the construction industry. So he actually walked me through the tiling process. When you start tiling, it's very tempting to just start in a corner. I would advise you not to do that. Rather than having big tiles on one side and then you reach the other end and have a little sliver, you want to maximize your tile size. Starting in the center of the room allows you to do that. Now another tempting alternative is to go with the existing grid pattern in your bathroom. The caveat with that. The adhesion of this peel and stick tile isn't going to stick to the existing grout and also the existing grout grout dips down a little bit lower than your tile. So there is more possibility for the tile to kind of pull away as well as water penetration. I could follow this tile pattern, but one, I don't like it. I don't think that they're very good at tiling this. Two, I want to make sure that it's not pulling up by the grout line. So before even purchasing the tile, I actually mocked this up in Illustrator. I took the tile pattern and I scaled it and I was able to arrange the tile to maximize the full tile potential. I don't have any little slivers. The method I found that'll best allow me to do that is to use the center between the casework and the shower as one data point, and then the center between the toilet alcove as another data point. That'll give me two datum lines, which will start my grid. To do this, you will need a chalk line. I got blue chalk because I'm working on a red, pinkish quarry tile, so blue will be a good contrast to that. Also, a of course, a tape measure so you can find the center of the room or wherever you're going to start your tile pattern and a nice framing square so that you can get a good right angle because you want to make sure you start out nice and straight. The starting point is really going to determine the future of the rest of the tile layout. I have my chalk grid laid out and I was sure to do it so the chalk will align to the seam rather than to the middle. My first grid of four will be right here. I will admit things are not going swimmingly. The adhesive it came with is not working on the tile, but I won't call it a manufacturer issue because it's not supposed to be attached to tile. So this is on me. I'm not using it as recommended. So that's a responsibility I bear. So my boyfriend gave me a really great idea. He said, why don't you just essentially wallpaper the entire floor with contact paper and the VCT will adhere to the contact paper. And he even said, Said you could wrap it up the cove base. I'm gonna give this a try. Hopefully it works. I am not deterred by failure. I'm gonna make this work. Good news. The tile is sticking to the contact paper. and you want to install a tile floor correctly, what you would do is remove the fixtures, install the tile floor, and then replace the fixture over on top of the tile. However, I am a renter. I don't have the ability to remove my fixtures, and so I'm going to need to work around them. In some cases, like here in front of the toilet, I was lucky that I was able to just slide it underneath existing toilet. There was that much of a gap. However, there's some tighter areas in the back that I'm going to 
need to cut some like weird specialty tiles to work around and I'm going to create a template to do so. What I have here is a piece of paper which I cut to the same size as the tile and I'm going to lay this down to match up with the tile grid and then bend these little flappies back to create the shape to work around and then I'll use that shape to trace onto the tile that I'm cutting. Last night after I finished installing the VCT I went ahead and caulked around my shower and my toilet just using a tub and tile caulk. So for caulking there's a lot of methods out there where they use tape and I have tried it. You don't need tape. All you have to do is spread the caulk out, lick your finger, run it across. Easy peasy. No need for tape. It's actually it could mess you up. It could pull the caulk right off. Just wing it. It's an art. Just take it as an art project. All right, so I'm finally finished with the VCT flooring and it was pretty easy application once I rolled out the contact paper. It adhered really well to the contact paper and I think the contact paper solution is actually going to make this a more printer friendly project. Of course, contact paper can be a pretty goopy mess when you remove it, so whenever the day comes, I will let you know if it is really printer friendly or not. Let's talk about the coat base, the edge where the tile meets the wall and you see the tile kind of runs up on the wall here and that's to mitigate water coming onto the wall and damaging it and also provide like a nice transition between floor to wall. Normally in a cove base you have a nice bullnose edge however mine is not a true cove tile. It looks like they just took the quarry tile and cut it in four inch strips and popped it on the wall. So if you don't have a cove base in your bathroom no worries all you have to do at that point to finish up your tile flooring you can go around the edge of the room with Call. If you do have a coke base like I do, there are a couple of solutions that we can use to cover up the coke base so it looks nice with your new floor. If you have a floor tile that isn't patterned, not very geometric, say a marble color or a just solid color, what could work very well for you is just take the VCT that you used on your floor and run it up the wall. However, this is not a solution for me because my tile floor is very patterned and you can see here there's going to be an issue of pattern meeting pattern of the wall. And then this pattern on the wall is going to meet the pattern on that wall. It's not going to align. Another solution, solid color. I have purchased from the hardware store just a black vinyl wall base and it is peel and stick. So I don't need an additional adhesive. That was important to me. This rolls like right up the wall. Okay, so now that I've finished the pattern floor, I actually don't think that this glass block looks that bad with the new flooring. However, I'm still not crazy about this transparent glass shower door because I don't like that I can see what's inside of my shower. So I've thought of some ways to use a shower curtain on the outside just to cover that for visibility reasons, not for a need of a shower curtain. You know, I've got the door doing that. I looked into rectangular shower curtain rods, but I couldn't find anything that fit my shower within my budgetary constraints. I don't want to spend a bunch of money on a shower curtain rod when I don't really need a shower curtain for useful reasons, just for visual reasons. A couple other options I explored. I could run a tension cord from this glass wall to the other wall. The reason I'm not pursuing that is because my shower up to the top of it is only 72 inches tall and my boyfriend is 72 inches tall. So if he uses my shower, he's gonna like have to duck to get in or like knock his head if I had a shower cord going from one end to the other. So I want to get the shower curtain high. What I decided to do, hopefully this looks okay, is just run a white tension rod from one side of the room to the other. Instead of a shower curtain, I got a regular like window treatment curtain. I don't need this for like waterproofing reasons, I'm just using it for visibility. For the final finishing touches, I wanted to mount a shelf above my toilet. I had some leftover IKEA Granholt brackets, but the nickel finish just would not do. So I scuffed it up a little using 320 grit sandpaper, wiped it clean with a cloth, and then primed the brackets with a Zinsser oil-based primer. I then hit it with the top coat. You guessed it, gold. I used short, light spray strokes and allowed the paint to dry completely before adding a second coat. Because the hardware is visible, the screws also received a coat of gold paint. To seal in that glorious gold color, I added a final top coat of Rust-Oleum Clear. Welcome to my upgraded bathroom.
biggest transformation came with laying new floor tile. The bold graphic pattern introduces some much needed personality into the space. I wasn't sure how I would like VCT as a flooring material in the bathroom, but I must say I have been pleasantly surprised. The VCT floor tile has great traction and is not at all slippery when wet. It's also nice not having a cold tile floor. My bathroom can get very cold in the winter, so a warmer floor has been a welcome change. You may be wondering about durability and how the VCT flooring holds up over time. Well, I installed this in August 2020 and I am recording this now in March 2021. So I've had this flooring in place for a full six months. VCT itself is a very resilient material, so any issues encountered would probably be due to installation rather than the product itself. And I was taking a risk because installing VCT tile over existing quarry tile is not recommended. That being said, it's worked out well for me. So far, the tile has remained firmly in place and still looks great. Of course, I won't be able to determine if there's any damage to the quarry tile underneath until I remove the VCT, so when that happens, I will definitely update you on that. I do take standard precautions to prevent water damage. I caulked around the shower and the toilet to prevent water from seeping underneath the VCT tile. I do use a bath mat on a regular basis. I just removed it for the purpose of this video because I'm trying to show off the floor tile. And anytime water spills on the floor, I promptly wipe it up with a towel. Now, a few people who have seen my bathroom so far have commented that the granite countertop looks a little bit out of place with the new finishes, and I tend to agree. I know that I could cover it with contact paper, however, I like the stone for its durability and heat resistance, and so I'm not going to cover it just yet. Maybe down the road, if I absolutely hate it, then I'll cover it, but for now, stick them with the stone. Providing a sophisticated contrast to the pattern floor tile is the hexagonal metal tile backsplash. While the peel and stick tile was easy to install, it adhered to the wall very well and was not at all repositionable. So I anticipate having to paint where the tile is now when I remove it to move out. However, I love the look of the tile and I think it'll be totally worth the effort. Fixing more things I hate, the curtain panel as a shower curtain has been working out well. Now I'm only five feet tall, so the tension rod at the top doesn't bother me at all. However, my boyfriend is six feet tall and so I think it bothers him a little more Maybe in the future we'll swap it out so it's only suspended from the ceiling and in front of the shower. However, this does serve a dual purpose because if you're sitting on the toilet and would like a little privacy, you could pull the shower curtain over to make a little toilet compartment. For the final finishing touches, I mounted a shelf above the toilet and hung artwork. These were all pieces that I already had. I got these decorative plates with the Haunted Mansion floor plans from a store that unfortunately no longer exists in downtown Disney called The Vault, and I actually had them sitting in a box for a couple of years because I didn't know where to hang them in my kitchen and then I realized they would fit in perfectly with my black and white bathroom. And this is from the grand opening of a project that I worked on at the World of Disney. It's actually a t-shirt that was signed by the original Mouseketeers. And there we have it. That's my bathroom makeover. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know what you think in the comments section below. I'm happy to answer any questions about peel and stick tile, whether it's the flooring or the backsplash. And if you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you give it a good little thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week.